Coming next on Landscapes Through Time, artist David Dunlop explores the magic of Venice to discover the art and inspiration of J.M.W. Turner. Hi, I'm David Dunlop. I'm a landscape painter. Here in Venice, this serene floating republic with its liquid streets, Venice has been calling artists for centuries. The Bellinis, Titian, El Greco, Cataletto, Monet, and Turner. How is it in the 19th century, one artist would redirect the course of art history, would revolutionize painting? J. M. W. Turner. From a humble beginning as a barber's son, with a mother lost to madness and an education that embarrassed him, Turner would go on to become the unrivaled master of watercolor, the greatest of all landscape painters. Imagine you're a Turner. You were raised in the smoky, dark, pinched alleys of London. Your world was monochromatic and fairly gray. To come here and find these broad expanses of water and sky, to discover this theater of color and light, the sun bouncing off of the buildings and the water. This would be the place for reinvention. Surprisingly, the reinvention, the revelation, the revolution in art should happen in such a short period of time. Turner makes three short visits here between 1819 and 1840, and all combined in less than a month. Yet, what he does here redirects the course of art history, will inspire artists across time. Jackson Pollock and Matisse claim his influence. We're going to set up our easels where Turner stopped, observed, experimented, and painted, and see if we can't step inside the eyes of Turner and discover his vision here in the city that was muse to his imagination. The peripatetic Turner found travel illuminating. Throughout his life, Turner searched for inspiration. He makes quick sketches in watercolors from the experiences he finds in places like this and returns to his London studio to reinvent them according to his own imagination. There's only one stage set like this. This is the Piazza San Marco. For landscape painters, this is the money shot. And it has been for centuries for both artists and tourists. When the once powerful thousand year Republic of Venice fell to Napoleon in 1797, this was the Las Vegas of Europe, a watering hole for wealthy tourists on their grand European tours. The British travelers brought home artistic souvenirs painted by renowned 18th century Venetians, Canaletto, Marieschi, and Guardi. In childhood, Turner's father and uncle recognized and encouraged his artistic promise. As a young artist, Turner worked for an architect's firm and studied with artists, including Thomas Girton, at a small private academy in the home of Dr. Thomas Munro, when at the age of 27, he was juried into London's Royal Academy of Art, the coveted credential which opened the doors of patronage for both sales and travel. His ambitions for travel on the continent were often stalled by warfare, so Turner explored England, Scotland, and Wales on commission trips. Publishers would convert his travel watercolors of architecture and famously sublime locations into engravings, which popularized Turner's reputation. Turner arrives here in 1819. He's 44, successful and well-known, and nestled at the intersection of East and West with ghosts of her illustrious past suspended in time, Venice still held the allure of a dissipated party town. Turner comes here to Venice to do his watercolors, watercolor sketches. Interestingly, he stays right here at the Hotel Europa then, which is now called the Biennale, with this view, and he paints down here where I'm standing now. He's always painting, he's always sketching, he's filling countless notebooks. It's something he does, it's how he thinks. And they're quick sketches, they're quick pencil sketches, they're quick watercolor sketches. Some he'll do in his room, some he'll do here. These are not finished pieces. These are meant as experiments for him to see what's going to happen, what can evolve, what are the possibilities in the watercolor. And sometimes the watercolors offer him possibilities for the oils. But he doesn't know what those are until he does the experiments. This is Turner's laboratory. Now when he's looking out here in this situation, one of the things he gets is the Dogana, San Giorgio, 
And of course, Santa Maria della Salute. Santa Maria della Salute is a very essential part of the visual landscape of Venice. Santa Maria della Salute is a Baroque church. It's loaded with Titians, a Tintoretto, 125 sculptures on the outside of it, Rococo squirrels. It's a wedding cake of a domed church. It's the crowning achievement of Longena, and it's one of the crowning achievements of Venice. And so it would naturally attract Turner. And it would attract him late in the day, earlier in the day, with the lights and a little more dramatic. What he does is he experiments with weather, meteorological conditions in his experiment with the watercolor. It's not just going to be a literal translation of the architecture. It's something entirely different. It's nothing like Canaletto. It's nothing like any of the 17th century, 18th century landscape painters. So Turner begins by sketching in little notebooks. They're no bigger than this. Some are even smaller than this. And he's going to do quick little linear sketches. And he tends to do horizons. And he's not going to outline the frame. He just notices the Dogana here, and a stretch, and a building situation, and a stretch, and a dome, and another dome. Just proportion, I'm going to do what he does, and that is change the shapes. So in order to get the scene from the Dogana into Santa Maria della Salute, I'm going to compress the space in between, just slice out some of that midsection. He'll repeat this sort of thing over and over, just looking for different sorts of silhouettes. What Turner's doing is just a shorthand notation. So he's comfortable with the view and how he might reinterpret it, because he's going to reinterpret it dramatically. He is not reporting. A drama is where he's going. He's coming from the sense of the theater, the sublime. This is the Romantic Age. He's a child of the Romantic movement. He's imbued with the spirit of Byron and the melodrama of all those Romantic poets. And to do that, he's going to have to reinterpret the facts. Frequently, by the time we're in the 1840s, there's no pencil at all. He's just painting, and it's just to get the effects. He'll put down, scrub out, work on several at a time. We know when he's doing the watercolors at home back in his studio in Chelsea, in London, he sets up with three or four buckets of water, boards with the pictures there, and he's working on one to another to another to another. Then, over the course of his career, he goes from more careful work to something that's much more expressive and much more emotive and loose. Turner's quest for Venice was not just for color and light, but it was for the inspiration in art history. Claude, his greatest inspiration, eclipsed only marginally artists like Tintoretto and Titian, and they were to be found here, throughout this city. In both Tintoretto and Titian, we find two artists who found their way to their feelings, found their way to the drama of persuasive gesture and paint, the poetry, the music of the painting, and Turner was determined to mine their imagination, their experience. I have a few images of Turner's painted right in this area. And what I want to show you is this is a scene that's very close to where we are now, on the Grand Canal, looking out into the Pacino. And the hours he chooses are late in the day, it's the golden hour. This is the time when the sun is low and we get a lot of yellow and red light. It's a favorite of his. He was aware of Goethe's color theory of Moses Harris, George Field. He was staying about where you see the picture taken. Now, Turner didn't take a picture with a camera. He didn't use a camera obscura. He was interested in photography at the end of his life. Remember, about 1836, 1839, we finally have fixed images in film. Now, this sort of a painting is a painting he wouldn't paint here in Venice. He painted those back in his studio in London. But he does do sketches, drawings, watercolors. His last trip in the 1840s, and this represents the 1840s, this is late Turner. So it's going to be much more expressive, much more ambiguity in the painting. And there's a scene that Turner did not have in the channels. At the moment, you can see how modern technology dwarfs Venice. Let's take a look at the sketch and see how this painting is designed. The waterline is down low, nowhere near the middle. The big element, the Dogana, is on the right side, and it helps frame San Giorgio over here. It's just as important to him to catch the quality of these reflections in the water. I have some light here. He has it extending. You see that the mirroring of the shape, the light shape, 
is important. He's holding on to the top corner in an interesting way, in this sort of scooped triangle. There are a few devices to hold on the two corners. This gondola here glues down this corner and keeps the viewer moving into the picture. The same is true over here. This smaller gondola in scale, bigger, smaller, tells us that there's a large extent of water. It's not in perspective scale, it just gives the viewer a sense of the space. So we've got a sense of how this works. It's a darker bottom, and we'll look for this triangle shape, one, two, three, moving in, and then the sky itself occupying the dark corner, holding on to everything up here. And we're gonna try some of that right now with some of the exaggerations and the mutations that Turner allowed himself in painting this scene. Now the palette. The ultramarine blue, he used chrome yellow, an iron oxide like burnt sienna. This is vermilion and azurite blue and white. Go to the oil. Okay, here we go. The underpaintings here are very warm and light, especially by this stage in his career. So if we were to mix, for example, this iron oxide and this yellow, we'll get a yellower base, but warmer than using the yellow by itself. That's a color he loves. He has some paintings that are just devoted to this color. He'll glaze with this color. He tends to think of yellow as the most dynamic color or plus color. It's the source of light. From Jen van Eyck to Vermeer, yellow was the light of paradise at Eden. It was the yellow of Eden and Arcadia for Claude, his hero, Claude Gillet, Claude of Lorraine. Now if I deepen it, I can go a couple of directions. I can go blacker by adding the ultramarine blue. I can go redder and keep it in the plus family. Goethe had done this enormous color theory work called the Farbenlehre, the book on color. He talks about minus and plus colors. That's one of the aspects of Goethe that appealed to Turner. And for him, a plus color are the yellows and the reds, and a minus color are the blue-greens, or the blues. So, here we are, time traveling to the 1840s. 1840, his last trip, his longest trip here, two weeks here. I'm down into the oil, picking up some walnut oil. Now, when Turner is doing his watercolors, he's just looking for these sorts of evocations that you see now. Now those ideas and the explorations from the watercolors by the 1840s are being transferred to this oil process. The lower we make that, the smaller this space becomes, the farther away and the deeper the space. Turner had the chair of linear perspective for the Royal Academy and he held it for a long time. He gave very interesting lectures, some were hard to follow. A deaf librarian said, the demonstrations were breathtaking. I love to just watch the man paint. Forget what he was saying. I'm removing paint to reveal some of that light and to keep alluding to the nature of the structure that's here. Remember, when I add a paint, I'm subtracting light. When I subtract paint, I add light, which is why he uses so many transparent colors where the light passes through the paint film and bounces off the light ground. The Dogana. As he painted the scene with very still water, he used the idea of reflection to create stronger verticals. We know from neuroscientists that we sustain our attention longer to verticals than we do to horizontals. So a horizontal picture with a number of verticals will help us sustain our attention. Because lights and darks were such an important aspect to him of the drama of the painting, Finding the light is what's exciting, and that's what happens with the scrubbing. And as he paints, a theory that is in his mind is called the theory of doubt, his definition of it. And he's going to exploit ambiguity, so you will guess as the viewer. So I'm making a violet here. Now that color is very complementary to all the yellows. If I'm at all true to Turner, it's about experimentation. And he passes that lesson on to John Ruskin who puts it in his lectures and his book, The Elements of Drawing. He feels the light traveling across the picture this way. Even Monet says 90% of Impressionism is owed to Ruskin from this touching of opposite colors next to one another. And the complementary 
effect of that blue and these yellows and oranges is something he found personally exciting. He'd read about it, he'd watched it, he'd experimented with it himself. He thought of himself as a scientific explorer as well as a poet. And an effect that is uncertain and, as he said, full of doubt, is a territory into which you can guess the appearance of clouds. If I want to put down a little bit of this red into here, something a little deeper violet, here's what happens if I add a white so you can see how it gets paler and grayer. One of the things Turner did is he stared at the water. He would study the water for long periods of time to the extent that people thought he was a bit daft. But he's getting a sense of how reflections work, how colors work. It really has no color by itself, and it's a mirror that's reflecting the activity of the sky. Turner realizes that it's all just a chaos, a soup of color and reflection, and that if he can give it back to the viewer in a certain suggestive arrangement, just this pixelated dust of color and light. They will bring their own memory, their own experience, their own way of looking, and they will see into it the cathedral, the ship, the clouds, the shimmer on the waves and the sunset. That's one of the essences of modernism. It's about making the viewer a bigger participant in the painting. Now if I deepen that again, so that there's a dark mood and set of shadows over here. I don't have to explain it, he counts on what Ernst Gombrich will call the beholder's share, the viewer supplying an answer to the ambiguity. There are other artists who had tried, and that's why he admired Titian, Tintoretto, Rembrandt. They had alluded to this place of imagination through suggestion, and Turner took it further than anyone ever had. To soften the edge where the clouds and the sky meet, that softer edge creates a greater sense of volume. The more broken an edge, the more indiscernible the edge, the greater the sense of volume for that territory. The more cleaved or sharp the edge, the flatter the space. And that's an observation he had made early looking at the paintings of Claude and that atmosphere that he saw in the Claudian landscapes in the 17th century when Claude was painting the Roman Campagna. One of the things he would want me to do is to take risks. It's why Turner is a hero to so many expressionists of the 20th century, just like Francesco Guardi. He not only was because he was taking risks, because he was unafraid of experimenting with chaos. It is out of chaos that we discover possibilities. That's what Leonardo da Vinci had said, look into the moldy stone wall, look into the embers of a fire, look into the chaos. And, as in his case, extended. I'm going to go to a little bit smaller brush, a one inch brush, and doing everything with my fingers and a two inch brush. Like Turner, I'm going to experiment with a violet gray to see if it doesn't offer me a way of amplifying the colors that are back in here. Just by putting that light violet against these yellows and oranges, you can see the modifying effects of simultaneous contrast. There's more glow, there's more light in the picture. Now, if I want to put some darker, as he designed, objects to drive you in with maybe a triangle of objects, driving you into the heart of the picture, there's a variety of ways we can do that. Setting up dark shapes is certainly one of them. Go to the oil and start to gather up some dark paint. Scumble information around. We don't have to know what it is. We just feel that there's something happening. Boats devices like Turner. I have gondolas in front of me. Let's hold on to this corner too. We've been holding on over here with some ambiguous darks as we are there. A little deeper blue if I wanted to do something to the top of that tower. Just put a little turp on the brush and mix it with let's say the yellow to pull out some more light here to draw my attention back there. Deeper violets getting to lighter as we go across the surface of the water. As you lower the horizon down here, which was a Dutch idea, so you could see that in 17th century Dutch paintings. He knew them, he borrowed it. That gives you a greater sense of drama, provides theater. And there's more sky than anything because the sky is the vehicle for mood, atmosphere, and light 
for Turner. He truly transmutes his feelings, his passions into paint. He leapfrogs over a century, painting from the landscape of imagination, the landscape of heart and passion. He is giving you a sensation, a feeling, an energy. That means he's going to have to personally interpret. And that is how he opens the door for future artists looking at his work. Rather than put a dark up there, I might just want to put a little more light up there and let it transition down. For him, the emotional power resides in the sensation of light. The principle of light against dark, this becomes more dramatic, more of the sense of the sublime and this feeling of the power of nature in contact with humanity. And for him, that is the evidence of the sky and the weather of the sky in relationship to the buildings. See how that light draws your attention and you go to where the light is. We name all of our deities after light. We name our demons after darkness because we're fearful of the dark and we're attracted to the light. And so it is with painting. Over here, you can see he's scumbled on what he calls thixotropic paint. He's made a paint that is thick and dries with a surface, a topography to the surface. And then it dries and he's able to rub in a transparent color in the crevices, the interstitial spaces of the surface. Blurring and uncertainty are essential aspects to evoking a mood and a quality of life for Turner. And a bristle brush. We know he used ox bristle brushes. I'm just developing a texture to the surface of the water something that would have intrigued him and that intrigues me, and we just are layering up. In his studio, this process takes time as we build layer upon layer. And you don't run the risk of mixing as many colors together. That's why he waits to do so much work in front of his friends on varnishing day, having pretty much set it in so that any color he mixes on top is not going to get muddy. It's already established. Now I'll float some things on top of that much more textured surface than I had a few minutes ago. The longer Turner paints, the more chaotic the work gets. Pictures from the very end of his career, 1845 to 1850, they are truly on the edges of abstract expressionism. He'll use rags, he'll use his hands, he'll use knives, he'll use all sorts of things to move into this paint to have it offer the light and the contrast that he's hoping to find. All light colors tend to expand and move forward, just as dark colors tend to recede and move back. And he's going to exploit that advance and retreat of value and color based on his studies of color and his own, of course, experience in the field. We don't have to know what they are, just that we're guessing. there's more light in the picture. Needed balance. Put a little more light up there. I'm just backlighting a few of these clouds to give them a little more authority than I do with my fingernail. In order to get a sense of the atmospherics and the movement, this triangle that I built here, which is Turner Rest, just as a shallower triangle here, going up to the point here, and secondary triangles. Ruskin called them flawed echoes. I've been playing with some of the themes that were important to Turner. That principle of interchange, what's dark becomes light, what's light becomes dark. That principle of unifying your masses, a principle of consistency. These were principles that Ruskin identified in Turner as tributes to Renaissance painters that he found in people like da Vinci or that he found in Claude or that he found in Rembrandt. 
So it's a chiaroscuro experience with more color than, let's say, Rembrandt had accessible to him. But still, we don't have the window in deep space until I pull the tape away, and you'll have a better illusion of the window. Turner has come to Venice three times in his life. He wanted to make it four, because Venice was his muse. Venice was an opportunity to explore. These paintings are about the sensual experience of feeling, of exploring his own feelings and being able to have the paint emote a condition of light, a sense of theater. As Matisse says, Turner finally frees us from the imitation of nature. What Turner has done is to give us an opportunity to look at paint as an emotional experience, not a narration, not a story. Light and color and texture and design usurp the old role of narrative with Turner. That transforms painting forever. In Venice, he tells us, all you need to do is look. I'm David Dunlop. I'm a landscape painter. Funding for this program was made possible by the following. On the next Landscapes Through Time, artist David Dunlop travels to Venice to explore the expressive paintings of Francesco Guardi.